Hello everyone, welcome. I'm Kim McKay, the Director and CEO of the Australian Museum and it's my honour to welcome you all here today and thank you for taking the time to join us to hear the plight of Australia's frogs from our herpetologist Dr Jodie Rowley along with our Chief Scientist Professor Chris Helgen. I'd like to start today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're gathered here at the Australian Museum of course we're on Gadigal land, but I know we've got people joining us from right across Australia today. In fact, well over 500 people are joining us on this webinar, such as the interest in the plight of our frogs and an understanding of their importance. I know that uh, during the last week or so, we've been watching the news and watching what's happening at the COP conference in Glasgow, still taking place. And while there's been some progress there, we would like to have seen more, and most commentators would as well. It's really important, I guess, for the future of biodiversity here in Australia that we have a very solid plan to move forward with and to ensure that all of our species, and we know frogs, for example, we have over 240 species that have already been identified across the country, that some of those frogs are in peril due to those changes. And Jody Rowley today, who is well known to many of you, is going to highlight the current issue facing frogs, especially on the east coast of Australia. At the end of uh, Jody's presentation today, there will be an opportunity for a Q&A session. So please use the Q&A function on your screen there uh, to ask questions at that time. Uh, of course, this webinar is being recorded and it will go on to the Australian Museum website so you can share it with others in the future as well. So Frog ID, of course, is the Australian Museum's flagship citizen science project. Uh, we've been doing it for over four years now and Jodie and her team have done a remarkable job. Everything from that wonderful little app, which I know most of you have downloaded and track frogs in your community, and so far we've verified um, 4,500 frog calls across Australia, which, sorry, 450,000 frog calls, I should say, across Australia. It's a remarkable job um, that Jody and her team do because we still can't analyse those calls with artificial intelligence. It is uh, often humans listening with headphones. That's my headphone impersonation uh, to the frog calls and identifying them. Today's story from Jody shows the mass mortality event uh, impacting frogs across Australia and it's something we'll be looking at as part of Frog ID Week coming up from the 12th of November as well. And uh, she's going to detail what exactly she is observing and she was just telling me that last night she was out till midnight in Wollongong in bushland observing frogs. So she's on the case um, but she has been observing uh, this mortality event that is really disturbing. And of course, the Australian Museum's research and the work of the Australian Museum Research Institute is critical to understanding what's happening and combating these issues in the future. So to hear more about that plan, I want to introduce you to Professor Chris Helgen, who is the Chief Scientist and Director of the Australian Museum Research Institute. Now, Chris uh, has been with us for over a year now at the museum, and he's responsible for well over a, a team of 80 at AMRI, including research scientists, collection scientists, collections officers, and then another 100 associates and fellows, as well as students who work here also. He was Professor of Biological Sciences at the University of Adelaide before joining us, and has focused his research primarily on field work with living animals and research in museum collections to uh, document the richness of life, explore global change and contribute to important problems in biomedicine. Now originally from Minnesota, but we've let him stay in Australia with his family, he served as curator in charge of mammals at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History in Washington DC. And he's been visiting the Australian Museum for well over 20 years before joining us permanently since his student days where he uh, did his uh, degree, uh, first degree under Professor Tim Flannery at Harvard. So I want to say a big welcome again to uh, Chris Helgen. It's great to have you on 
our executive team here at the museum, Chris, and for your leadership. And I should say, Chris has also discovered uh, and named well over, I, I believe, 100 mammals himself. So he's got quite a track record. So please welcome Professor Chris Helgen. Thank you so much, Kim. <clears throat> what a pleasure to be here today for a very important uh, discussion. Now, all of you on the call will know much about what the Australian Museum stands for in the community. It's incredible public facing galleries, it's educational programs, and as you are all aware, it's citizen science approaches to pursuing important questions in natural history, like our Frog ID app. Uh, sometimes what uh, not everyone is aware of is what Kim has just discussed, that we have inside the museum a real center for scientific research in Australian natural history writ large. So we study uh, the biology, the life sciences, the earth sciences, geology, paleontology, and the cultural heritage of Australia. And we are uh, Australia's first museum, and we've been a center for this for almost 200 years. Today, our scientists in Amory are involved in many things you might not expect. We have wildlife forensic biologists who are involved in combating the international illegal wildlife trade. We have scientists that do the genetic IDs on the birds that uh, strike aircraft and commercial and uh, military aviation across Australia, documenting what threats exist to uh, aircraft in this country. We have scientists who were some of the first to be called in in the bushfire uh, crisis of recent years to try to understand by comparing what was known before to what was known immediately after to see how these incredible emerging uh, large events that are affecting Australia are affecting the nature around us and how that affects us in turn. Uh, we are involved with things like fisheries across the coastlines of Australia, especially in New South Wales, holding one of the largest collections of fish in the world. All of these kinds of things uh, speak to the fact that we at the museum are passionate about studies of natural history, but we're also passionate to connect those with real world problems that help us understand the issues that Australia is facing today. And today we come to you to discuss a genuine Australian natural history emergency. And this is a widespread mortality event of Australia's frogs. Many species involved, many thousands of events being recorded, especially up and down the east coast of Australia, but elsewhere too, as you're going to hear. Now, one of the ways that we know about this event and that we've been clued into it very rapidly as it's emerged is the Frog ID app that so many of you contribute to. Tens of thousands of users across Australia are using the Citizen Science app to, as Kim mentioned, generate data about hundreds of thousands of frogs, almost half a million records of frogs. Which frog is where? What's it doing? What time is it calling? Is the population healthy? What's the environment like? Forget the canary in the coal mine, frogs, amphibians worldwide are the most important sentinel species for understanding much about, about the health of our terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems. Now, I'm going to in introduce someone extremely important. She is the leader of our Frog ID program. She is the curator of herpetology, which is the study of reptiles and, and amphibians here at this museum. Tremendous job. Can you imagine? She's also a faculty member with the Center for Ecosystem Science at the University of New South Wales. She wears many hats as a scientist and a science communicator. Her passion is for amphibian biodiversity, the richness of life and conservation. She's compelled by questions like how many species of frogs are there in Australia? But not just that, where do we find them? Are they under threat? Are some species becoming extinct how do we protect them? Frog ID is helping with that, and so is all the other kinds of baseline science programs that we're doing here at the museum to understand Australian biodiversity. Now, Jody's gonna tell you in some depth about the problems that frogs are facing, and this is, again, something that's emerged rapidly, unexpectedly, 
and urgently. We're having this discussion because we need your help. And Jody's going to paint the picture for you, after which we're going to come back and have a chance to talk together, me and Jody, uh, to answer questions that you might have uh, that will help you understand what's going on and how you can help. All right, here we have Jody. Jody, I'm going to turn it over to you, to the audience, and tell us about the dire event that we're speaking about today. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, so I, I guess I, I love frogs and, that, and that's why I'm here. And I, as Chris alluded to, am in a, a dream job for me. Uh, so I get to spend my time researching and trying to help better understand and conserve the amazing amphibians and reptiles that we have in Australia and more broadly. Uh, we are very lucky to have more than 243 native species of frog because since I presented last uh, on, on this mortality event, uh, we've actually had two species described as new to science. So um, I think this highlights not only just how amazing our frogs are, the diversity we have, you know, how many different shapes and sizes that they come in, but also how poorly they're known. So two species within a couple of weeks are new to science in Australia, which is amazing. And, and we have more to discover and Frog ID is in part uh, helping with that as well. Uh, but we're, we're starting at a pretty bad baseline with frogs. And I didn't fall in love with frogs because they were threatened and because they were vital in ecosystem uh, uh, functioning. I fell in love with frogs because I just thought they were amazing. Um, but unfortunately, I will never see at least four species of frog. I will never get to hear and neither will most of you see or hear um, four, at least four species of frog in Australia because they are now extinct. And I think that is an, an absolutely terrible thing. Uh, so you can actually listen to the call on the Frog ID app of several species that uh, unfortunately we believe are extinct in the wild and we will never get to hear ourselves, which I think is, is very, very haunting. In addition to the species that we've lost, we've, we've got uh, more than 30 species that are on the edge of extinction. Our frogs are not doing well. Australia doesn't have a great track record. And that's one of the reasons we need your help with Frog ID uh, and other things. And why are frogs threatened? They're extremely sensitive to any kind of environmental change. So any kind of habitat loss or modification, introduced species, including predators, climate change, uh, disease in particular, has been um, a massive uh, cause of amphibian declines, even in, within protected areas. So you think that frogs might be safe when they're in a national park, um, but disease has, has, does not respect those boundaries. Uh, and in particular, one disease, uh, which is notable, uh, the amphibian chytrid fungus is, causes a disease called chytridiomycosis and it was first discovered in dead and dying frogs in the 1990s, uh, but it's been present since at least the 1970s. It's now very, very widespread. It invades the skin of frogs, which is kind of their Achilles heel. So uh, it, it disrupts their, the function of their skin. They're not able to kind of drink through it. Uh, electrolytes aren't able to go through it as much. And, and so that's sort of um, one reason they can die rapidly from this disease. Um, and so uh, the sort of global amphibian declines uh, in, in the 80s um, were primarily driven by this disease, which we believe was uh, introduced around the world accidentally by humans. And this is an ongoing cause of declines in frog species in Australia. Uh, so it's another thing, aside from all the other things that frogs have to deal with, they do have to deal with, with this disease. But why should we care about frogs and why should we care about these declines that I'm going to update you on? Um, and I know I mentioned this if you saw the, the, the first talk that I gave about this emergency sort of mass mortality response, uh, but frogs are really abundant. Uh, in healthy ecosystems, you just need to go into the outback in, in the sort of pouring rain and you realise just how many frogs are probably underfoot any time you walk anywhere in Australia or should be. Uh, so frogs are usually a really big part of healthy ecosystems. And so obviously it makes sense that when something happens to them, then that kind of spreads throughout the, the web of life, really. They're a vital part uh, of ecosystems connecting freshwater with the land. 
and so energy flows and nutrient dynamics. Uh, frogs put energy in the form of eggs into the streams and ponds. They then sort of munch up aquatic vegetation. The tadpoles then emerge onto land, transferring all that energy onto land and the cycle kind of starts again. And they're an incredibly important part of food webs. So not only do tadpoles eat a lot of algae and frogs eat a lot of invertebrates, including pest species, but frogs and tadpoles are also really tasty food for a whole lot of other animals. And so they are a really big, important part of, of the systems. And in places where frogs have declined, you do notice the impacts. So the streams clog up with algae, uh, all the other animals that rely on frogs for food, like reptiles, birds, mammals, they start to disappear as well. There are some more selfish reasons we might care about frogs as well. For example, frogs like this Holy Cross frog, the, the beautiful dot painting, um, they actually have amazing chemicals on their skin. So every species of frog has its own suite, its own chemical cocktail on its skin that is actually helping it from getting infected by things. Uh, but it's actually a lot of them, the, the sort of secretions on frogs are now being used um, to be explored in human medicine, antivirals, uh, anti antibiotics, anti fungals, all sorts of things, uh, even uh, glue for use in human surgeries as well. And, and if anyone um, has been gooed by a frog before, they'll know how sticky that is. And in, aside from just frogs themselves, monitoring frogs and caring about our frogs, frogs are fantastic bioindicators. Some species you'll find in the middle middle of the city but for the most part frogs are very very sensitive and so when you start changing things up then they are some of the first animals to respond uh, including to climate change <clears throat> And as Chris mentioned, at AMRI, we're involved in a lot of different aspects of frog research. So uh, looking for scientific discoveries of new species in Australia and elsewhere, trying to understand the threats facing our frogs, searching for missing species. And so we have made some important, uh, fantastic rediscoveries. And Frog ID has also helped uh, discover missing populations of frogs too, which is some really fantastic news, uh, kind of informing conservation decisions and uh, also citizen science. And this is where the Frog ID app comes in. So for me, um, I wasn't involved with citizen science really until the Frog ID project commenced. And it's it's been a total game changer. Um, there are not enough biologists in the world to be able to respond to the biodiversity crisis that we're facing. And what we need is an army of people out there helping get the information that we need to better understand and conserve our biodiversity. And that is exactly what Frog ID has done. So in a little less than four years, uh, we've had uh, over 26,000 users actually record frog calls. Um, and this is resulting, we are hoping that this year we might reach half a million frog records in Australia. And to put this into perspective, this is doubling the number, number of frog records, of scientific frog records that we had across Australia before Frog ID in about four years, which is remarkable. And that is thanks to everybody out there recording frog calls. Uh, and so this has revolutionized our understanding of frogs uh, and particularly uh, Frog ID Week, uh, which is our annual snapshot of frogs, which is coming up from the 12th to the 21st of this month, um, is really vital in getting that year on year understanding of how frogs are doing. So I guess cutting out some of the ups and downs, we need this long term data set to understand how our frogs are doing. And Frog ID has already been vital in understanding the impacts of drought and bushfires, and it will be vital in understanding the impacts of this mortality event on our frogs. Before I talk about the current mortality event that, that is happening, um, there are some, even more than last time, um, some upsetting images and, and statements. Um, and this event, and I was in lockdown in Sydney, just getting a lot of emails, it was really, really upsetting for me. Um, and I can't imagine how upsetting it is for everybody out there, many of whom will be on this call to actually be seeing this themselves. Um, you know, I, I love frogs and getting thousands of emails with photos and stories about dead frogs was absolutely awful. And it should be awful. It should be awful to us. This is not normal. This should not be happening. 
Okay, in saying that, um, what people are observing, and this is because I until recently have not been able to get out there myself, I have had to be relying on this army of people across Australia reporting what they're finding. Uh, so, for example, out in midwinter in broad daylight, they have all been quite lethargic and have eventually died where they're first found. Their skin has been a strange dark colour, almost black. And you can see photo in particular of that green tree frog. They're called green tree frogs because they're typically brown, but that frog is almost red. And another statement, I noticed four green tree frogs in the daytime looking very lethargic and discoloured in our garden. Within 24 hours, I had discovered each to be deceased. And that has been a very, very similar statement that we've received. So a frog will kind of look like normal, but maybe be sitting out somewhere a bit weird, open in the daylight. Most of this was in winter, although it still is happening. Uh, most of this was, was in winter and it was very strange that a frog would be sitting out in the day, out in the open, and they would go from kind of looking like a healthy frog doing something weird to dead within one day. So really, really rapid. Another statement, for the last three or so months, my family and I have noticed that many green tree frogs have been turning up dead around our house. It's been quite recently that we've noticed them coming out from where they usually, uh, they usually live. They appear to be skeletal in appearance and quite dark. It is within just a day of seeing them on the ground that they turn up dead. And remember that green tree frogs, which have been the most reported uh, frog, they can live for more than 30 years. So you're noticing something that you've seen around in your house, if you've been living there year on year on year, that it might have a name, it might sit in your letterbox sometimes and then move out and sit somewhere. You're familiar with this frog. And then all of a sudden you're finding bodies literally around your backyard. So the kind of key things, I guess, is that sick frogs typically, they've been out in the daytime, often in winter and in exposed places. So on the footpath, um, so that Perrin's tree frog that you find on, on the right image there is actually alive. And um, there was a subsequent photo where it was dead, uh, but just sitting there in the sun. So obviously feeling like it needed maybe to get to get warm, um, burrowing frogs actually coming out of the ground where they, you know, in dry times and just sitting somewhere in the open and dying. Slow moving, lethargic skin, lighter or darker than normal for green tree frogs in particular, often a reddish brown um, and often a reddish on the belly and patchy peeling skin are some of the kind of symptoms of, of what's going on. And so, um, yeah, that, that's a, a video that's not moving. Um, oh, here we go. So this is a sick frog. So not responding out in the daylight sitting there and you can see not being able to hop properly and I'm sorry for showing this but it's I guess to show how serious this is how awful it is so the frogs are really really ill um, obviously dead frogs have also been found um, they've been dying very rapidly um, their skin is often darker than normal so a lot of green tree frogs shriveled and black um, and thin frogs and the reports have been coming from across Australia, uh, particularly the East Coast, particularly New South Wales. So each one of these dots represents a location where somebody has got in touch with the Australian Museum through the frog ID email and reported a dead frog now or a sick frog. Not 100 percent of these frogs were likely to be um, dying due to the sort of current, the same cause that whatever is happening in this mortality event. Occasionally one might be uh, road uh, mortality, uh, being run over by a car or something like that. So it's important to kind of keep that in, in mind. But this is not normal. This is not um, a normal number of frog mortalities and, and sicknesses. And almost every single frog that was reported sick ended up dying as well. There's one instance I know where the frog actually ended up surviving due to veterinary treatment. Um, but th this, is, uh, this is absolutely awful. One dot doesn't represent one frog as well. So each of these roughly 1,500, I think when more, but more than 1,500 reports of dead and dying frogs across Australia, they actually represent many more thousands. So we're seeing people reporting 40, hundreds, uh, a couple of frogs every week, uh, a couple of frogs every day. So some of these represent a large number of frogs. 
And these are just the frogs that people are reporting. So getting emails after emails, one day we received uh, 280 emails reporting sick and dead frogs in a single day, um, which was awful and, and yeah, something that, that I hope we never get to see again. And one thing that you notice about this map, and although definitely it seems like things are happening a lot more on the East Coast, is that when you compare it to the map of Australia frog ID records on the right, you see a striking, striking resemblance. And that is because they essentially have a strong tie to where people are. Both of these projects are citizen science based. It's not thanks to people like myself out there for the most part, it's people reporting what they see. And particularly during lockdown, people weren't traveling too much. And so what this actually shows to me, which is incredibly alarming, it's not just the East Coast, it's not just a few places, it's probably absolutely everywhere, but we're only getting reports of frogs from where the people are from the people. Can you imagine how many frogs are dying in the bush, in thick grass and aren't being reported? This is even more evident when you start to zoom in and have a look at the frog reports. These are around Sydney and you can see that the green areas, the national parks, the more remote areas, we're not getting many reports. Most of the reports are along the roads and in the more built up parts of Sydney, but they're very widespread throughout those areas. The same thing in northern New South Wales and the sort of extreme sort of Gold Coast, um, southeast Queensland, you notice the same kind of thing. The reports come from where the people live. This is really widespread. This is not normal. Um, and and this, is, this is happening across Australia. Most of the focus, uh, particularly in the media, has been that it's green tree frogs. And indeed, about 60% of, of all the frogs reported dead and dying have been green tree frogs. Uh, but how much that actually is due to um, them being the ones that people tend to see around their houses and how much is it that they're really the ones that are most dying, we're not entirely sure. So although num the number one reported frog has been the green tree frog, we're also getting cane toads, quite a lot of cane toads reported dead and dying. So that's the second, number, the number two species. Uh, third, Perrin's tree frog, which occurs um, particularly sort of along the, the sort of southeast Australia and in, in Sydney, this is a really commonly reported frog that has been turning up dead and, and along the south coast as well. And the list goes on. So these are the top nine species that have been reported with their photos in life and then a subsequent report of the frog in death as well. And in total, there's 35 species of frog that have been reported dead and dying in this mortality event. And that's just the frogs that are being reported. That's just the frogs that are around where people are. We just have no idea how many more threatened, more remote frog species are suffering at the moment. For example, these three species have been reported uh, dead and dying. These are all threatened species, the giant barred frog, the green and golden bell frog and the southern bell frog. So these are part of the mortality event and we don't know how their populations are going to be faring on into the future. Um, these species are already pushed to the edge by so many other things. The last thing they need is something that's going to wipe out more of, of their population. And I've been investigating as part of a, a big collaboration. So this isn't just me at all. I tend to be the one that talks about it more, but this is a huge collaboration. This is particularly a collaboration with Taronga Zoo and the Australian Registry of Wildlife Health, uh, Dr. Carrie Rose and Jane Hall. Uh, I'm not a vet, I'm not a pathologist. So these guys have been out there and, and we're really working together um, to try and get to the bottom of what is happening. Um, and I'm also really lucky to work with an amazing group of people at the Australian Museum, Chris Portway, Jordan Crawford Ash, Tom Parkin, Dane Trembath, Gracie Liu, Tim Katea. We've all been working on this mortality event in the lab, in the field uh, and on the emails as well. So I'd like to acknowledge that.
I'd like to also acknowledge the support of so many government institutions, conservation organisations, biosecurity organisations, and every single person out there that has reported a frog, uh, that has sent us an email, and that has helped support this investigation because we're desperately working to get the bottom of this, but we can't do it alone. We need your continued support. These are some photos of frogs that we've managed to gather thanks to people uh, either sort of we've been picking them up um, since we've been able to, they've been sent to the museum, dropped off to the museum. Uh, and so we are it, with each of these frogs, we're, we've started the investigation. If you've managed to gather a frog and we've got it, um, we will be letting you know whether or not um, or what the what the results are as we start going. So we are definitely not through the investigation at the moment, um, but we we have been uh, getting samples, particularly tested for the amphibian chytrid fungus. And if you've sent us a frog, we will update you when we get those results. It's too early to know for sure what is happening here. We know that the amphibian chytrid fungus is involved. So it's certainly present in many of the frogs that we are sampling. However, uh, it's also present in healthy frogs that we're finding in the wild and in many of the frogs that we're getting, um, that we're testing that have died, the, the levels of infection aren't really, really high. Um, and we're also finding quite a lot of frogs that actually don't seem to have any amphibian chytrid fungus on them. So we are exploring all options uh, and Taronga, um, the Australian Registry of Wildlife Health is leading some genomic work, investigating that. Um, and we will be, uh, I guess it's a very, very big task to try and find what something, what could be happening. Um, but we are on the job. We don't, I personally don't believe that the amphibian chytrid fungus is the whole story, but it definitely is part of the picture. The next big question and in parallel to desperately trying to find what is causing this event is trying to understand what is the impact of this event. So what is the impact on, on frogs like the green tree frog? They're quite a common species. And so we think that, uh, you know, they're going to continue to hopefully be a very common species. Where that might not be the case might be around Sydney, where we've already noticed that frogs, uh, green tree frogs, are almost disappeared from Sydney. So could this event potentially be something that is uh, going to, I guess, sort of make these really sort of sensitive southern extent populations disappear? We don't know. Um, and we need your help to investigate that. What about for more threatened species? So for example, the Buralong frog, which is hanging on, we know that it's already impacted heavily by the amphibian chytrid fungus, as well as habitat modification, introduced species, all these other things. We don't yet know how it's fared. Um, so I'll, I will be heading up and checking on some frogs uh, next week. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to get a better understanding of the impact on these frogs. But obviously there's a lot of frogs, a lot of threatened frogs. And so it's taking a team of scientists um, and everybody using Frog ID to help understand uh, the impact of this event on our frogs so that we can not only figure out what the impact is, but how we can mitigate uh, any more amphibian losses. So we don't need to lose any more of Australia's frogs. We have already started getting out into the field and we have some sort of preliminary results, uh, but we definitely wanted to get a little bit warmer as well so that some of the, the frogs uh, come out a little bit more. But we've been monitoring some more common species around the Sydney area and have just started uh, extending out and, and trying to understand the impact of some of the more threatened species uh, such as the Burralong frog and the, the southern barred frog as well. So we're lucky enough to have been uh, monitoring many of these species previously Previously, so we can now go back and actually do some more scientific surveys at these sites and see what the difference is, how the frogs are faring, uh, what their level of amphibian chytrid fungus is, um, and uh, I guess the, their general overall health. And so we're desperately working uh, to, get, to get to the bottom of what's going on in the field, which is a parallel investigation to the causation and, and figuring that out in the lab. And as I mentioned, we, we really can't do this alone. 
uh, the mortality event is occurring across Australia. There's so many, so many frog biologists. We need to get a widespread understanding of its impact. So we need you to download the Frog ID app if you don't already have it and record frogs this spring and summer so that we can get a much better understanding of what is going on. We can identify the sites where we're not getting species that are calling where we really should because we've got four years of data in the past. Now we have an amazing data set, thanks to everyone out there, um, that we can use to, to sort of pinpoint, okay, wait a minute, this frog was calling the last three years, but we're not getting any recordings now. And then we can go there ourselves, we can assess the health of the population, and we can actually do on the ground scientific surveys. And as an example of the kind of things that the Frog AD data set might, might help us find, uh, I actually just exported the Frog ID data and I looked uh, at a single species, so the southern barred frog, Mixifuse balbus. And you can see we started getting records of this species in 2018, uh, just after the Frog ID project launched. Uh, each of, this is a calendar year, each little sort of square is a day. And so you can see we only got a couple of recordings um, and then there's a big gap over winter where they don't call and then in spring they start up again. So uh, in September in uh, 2018, 2019, they even called a little bit earlier, um, but we always do get recordings in September. This year, we don't yet have any recordings of the southern barred frog. So this is a species that we desperately need to get out there and do surveys to assess the impact of this mortality event. Now, I don't know what we will find, but this is a demonstration of how vital the Frog ID project can be in pinpointing which species might need our help. And we've been getting emails from people, which is amazing. And I can't stress enough how much this collaboration is not just scientists, it's not just government and, and other partners. This is a collaboration with the whole of Australia, with everybody that's emailed. We're getting some mixed results with what, what you guys think is happening to frogs. So we've been getting statements like there are a lot less frogs in general. You know, we've started seeing living frogs again instead of just dead frogs but they're last year's young and that's actually something we've heard quite a lot so that the older frogs the adult frogs have died but they are starting to see the younger frogs um, statements like about a month ago there was 20 or so in the same section of stream making a lot of noise last night there was only two you know we usually hear eastern striped marsh frogs all summer but we've hardly heard them so far but then there are good news sort of statements like there are still plenty of fat, healthy frogs living in our down pipes and popping out every night. So we do want continued sort of comments as well. So not only using frog ID, but if you're noticing something in your frogs, please let us know. If you're noticing only baby frogs and no adults, if you're noticing less frogs or you're noticing healthy frogs, please also let us know as well as recording frog calls. So we're only kind of in the middle of figuring out this mass mortality event. It is still occurring. It's not winter anymore. It's getting warmer. We were hoping that the frog die-off would be stopping when it got warmer and the frog's immune system sort of kicked off. And we are definitely seeing less reports, but frogs are still dying. So please keep watch for sick or dead frogs and please report them to us with the frog ID email. We really, really, really need you to be recording frogs with frog ID to get to the bottom of the actual impact on the frogs themselves. Uh, so particularly during Frog ID Week, which is very soon, so from the 12th to the 21st of November, please record frogs as often as you can. I stress to be very conscious of hygiene, uh, sort of biosecurity hygiene in Frog ID Week. So if you are moving from one place to another, just wash and disinfect your shoes because we need to be extremely careful. And of course, don't touch frogs. Frog ID is all about recording the calls of frogs. So it's a tool that, that we need you to use to be able to non-invasively monitor how our frogs are going and, and find out what is, is, is happening so that we can get to the bottom of this. And we also need, your support more broadly. We need your support to get out there and do scientific surveys to test frogs in, in the lab, the dead frogs that we find and the swabs from the frogs that we're able to take in the field. We desperately need to get on the ground and do field work. And for that, we really do need your help. 
And I guess lastly, I would just again like to thank everyone so much um, because this is the biggest collaboration I've ever been involved in. Uh, and, and I'm just so grateful for everybody's help. This is a really, really, really awful event. It's not meant to be happening like this. This is not normal. Frogs are dying. But with a team of people out there, like I know there is, it desperately gives me hope that together we can solve this mystery and, and we can save our frogs. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Jody. Uh, everyone who has been on this on this call on this webinar is now informed you know about what kind of problem we are facing um, you are on call now you know what the problem is uh, to think about you know what it is that everyone can do to help uh, jody is someone who is so passionate about frogs that when something like this is going on, you wouldn't, I mean, you'd believe it, but you hardly can imagine how tirelessly she is working. It's extraordinary. She is out there constantly. So is her team that you heard about. She was out at, uh, up till past midnight last night, frogging out in the Wollongong area. Uh, and this is how she's spending uh, her evenings. And this is, this is uh, uh, how she's uh, uses her time to study the frogs of Australia in normal times. But these, as she said, these are not normal times. Look, as wildlife biologists, we don't see this kind of event hardly ever. This is not normal. Um, this is extraordinary, and it is really, really scary. You've seen some of the pictures, you've seen some of the statistics. For something to be continent-wide, to affect so many species, and to still um, remain sort of a mystery. You know, we don't yet know which species are affected most does it affect all frogs and exactly what is this pathogen or pathogens what is it what diseases are involved here until we know that until we pin it down like forensic scientists like detectives like wildlife biologists we can't really know for sure how it's spreading what impacts it's having and how to stop it so these are really really important things you can see that jody and her team are making progress they're making progress on figuring out what's happening in an extraordinary way, in a way that would be impossible in Australia, again, without the Frog ID app and without all of the users like you who are out there uh, using it. So um, let's go to some questions. I've, I see some, some great questions uh, pouring in. And um, um, so let's start to think uh, together some of the ways that Jody said that we can help. And then we'll jump to some of these questions about how that can work. Um, some of the ways you can help, remember, use the Frog ID app. Keep using it. Keep making your recordings because what you're finding is going to be added into the data set of how frogs are doing. And do it especially during the upcoming Frog ID week. But keep it going. We need that data. Report to, uh, to Frog ID email any mortality events you're seeing. Some people are asking, now, if we are seeing, if we are observing sick or dead frogs, we can report them. But, you know, Jody, uh, how should we handle them? What do we do? How can we get them to you um, to help with this study? Jody, what do you think? Well, we've got a team of frog biologists, including myself, monitoring that, that frog ID email so we can give you locally relevant information, let you know what the local vet near you or the closest vet near you that's collaborating with us in, in getting to the bottom of this um, and we can provide more details. So we're on that email, please just get in touch with us and we'll give you specific information. The, the biggest thing is not to touch the frogs yourself with your hands. Um, if you find a dead frog, uh, then uh, the best thing to do is use a, a Ziploc or a bag, like you would pick up a dog poo, sort of in, invert it and then pick up the frog and make sure your hand doesn't touch it. Uh, and, and this is if it's a dead frog and then, and then sort of seal, seal the bag. With sick frogs, if you can send us a photo, we can let you know as well, because sometimes it's hard to tell if the frog is actually sick or not, if it's got something strange on its skin or if it's a normal sort of coloration. So we will start that discussion with you um, and, and let you know the best way to proceed. But certainly uh, hygiene is, is really important in terms 
terms of not touching the frogs themselves, especially with your hands. And in terms of disinfectants and things, there's some really great resources, particularly um, the New South Wales government has them out with regards to sort of biosecurity and fungal diseases, but um, essentially like different bleaches, F10, if, if you're a vet and you, you have access to that, or even um, specific kinds of like toilet duck actually have things that you can soak your shoes in and scrub scrub them off. So um, we'll share those resources as well um, with, with everyone. And that's that's really important, Jody. I mean, when we when we don't know exactly what what disease is involved and how it is spread, uh, we have to make sure that everyone's being as careful as possible that they're not adding to that spread. So that's what you're talking about with with disinfectant. When people are moving from one area to another, one protect you know a national park to another, a pond to another, that's where they should be taking great care, isn't it? Yeah, so certainly if you're just walking yeah, around yeah, your yeah. little backyard, you, you probably don't need to worry so much. But if you're going from one frog habitat to another, we don't know where exactly what what this is, where it's distributed, but we certainly don't want to be part of the problem. We don't want to be spreading accidentally any kind of, of bug, virus, bacteria, fungus, anything on our feet from one place to another and sort of moving things around. I think we all understand now more than ever the, the importance of, of you know hygiene. We're all busy, you know, disinfecting our hands using using um, the sort of hand sanitizers and things. But it's it's also really important for our wildlife's health as well to to make sure we don't move things around that affect them. Um, and yeah, and we don't want to be part of the problem. Yeah. And I encourage everyone, as you will, everyone here will to take take that really seriously. We need to make sure that um, have, that there is not spread uh, unnecessarily between habitats. So when you're out there with Frog ID, which you will be next week, uh, learning as much as you can about uh, how frogs are doing, um, keep that in mind. Now, um, we've got other great questions here. Uh, a really important question I see here, you know, someone's asking, now what effect does frequent fire or the bushfires have on, on frog species? Is that part of the story here? Is the changing climate, is the warming temperatures that we have in Australia, you know, is that is that part of this story too? What do you think about that, Jody? It definitely could be. So if it is the amphibian chytrid fungus and there's no other sort of you know virus or fungus or bacteria or any kind of bug involved aside from that um, and it's not a new strain of it then what it could be is actually just that the frogs are really stressed out um, potentially and that, that that's you know it could be uh, environmental stress from drought and fire it could be um, any other kind of stress potentially toxins and things like that which is, is something that we're working on ruling out as well uh, with collaborators um, and so we know that frogs most frog species or many frog species are able to survive the fire so obviously frogs do die um, but some don't and the frog ID database so people out there recording frogs after the the massive sort of black summer bushfires of 2019 and 20 they actually helped us understand how resilient frogs can be so if, with frogs calling only a day or two after the fire and with widespread sort of short-term persistence but we don't know what the long-term implications of this event are. Um, and we don't know, you know, with the drought beforehand, stressing them out with the additional fire, what if uh, we then get another fire? Um, and so I guess we, we've got a lot of questions uh, around uh, frogs and there is a lot of threats facing frogs and they just really don't need another. Um, and we don't know how all these different threats interact with frog species. And so uh, I think, I guess this is a really, really hard investigation. Um, we have to look at actually everything, things are connected, things take time. I wish that we had a result right away, but if it wasn't for the help of everybody out there getting us these frog samples, we wouldn't be able to do this investigation. Uh, and so thanks to everyone out there, we're working really hard and we're getting some answers, but ruling things, uh, I guess, out uh, and, and discovering potentially new mysterious things that are going on um, is is a detective it's a lot of detective work yeah yeah and I, I i mean i've been blown away by the community involvement and how much uh attention uh this is getting out and, and out there that people are submitting so much information and they're sending so many frogs in it is extraordinary 
Again, people are asking in the chat, you know, how can we help? Rem remember, you can keep using the Frog ID app. You can uh, report these mortalities. You can talk to us about how to get us uh, frog samples if that's if that's uh, um, something that that uh, Jody is looking for when when uh, she interacts with you. Uh, but uh, we also need your uh, financial support, and that's one thing we're talking about today. We need you, if you're able to do it, um, to help us raise some funds to do this. What are we talking about? We're talking about funds that are simply needed to keep Jody and her team going out to the field where they need to go to explore what's happening, to get on the ground and see this for themselves, to collect the frogs that are going to help us answer this mystery. Um, we need uh, we need funds that are going to help um, uh, with the postage and the freight of all these uh, samples, some of them frozen or or critical time timing uh, samples from all around Australia to get to us in our labs here at the Australian Museum and at Taronga Zoo, uh, and we need um, we need that um, that fund those funds from from you as well to help us um, diagnose, do the work, the me the biomedical examinations, the testing that's helping us get to the bottom of is this as is often the case in amphibians, is it chytrid fungus? Is it chytridium mycosis? It doesn't seem like that's the whole story. So what is the rest of it? Are we looking at bacterial disease? Are we looking at other fungal disease? Are we looking at a virus? There are so many possibilities. And I feel like, Jody, that we're getting closer, um, but this is work that's still ongoing. And so that is what we're talking about when we need support for the science behind the scenes of what's going on here, yeah? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, we, we need to get answers potentially before next winter as well. So if this is something that affects frogs in, in winter, we need to know what species need our help now, what management recommendations we need to have, how we could treat this, how we can minimise the impact on our most vulnerable frog species. Uh, so it is a very urgent task um, and, and we're on the job, but we only have samples and reports thanks to everybody out there thankfully we we are able to move out there and get on the ground and actually see the frogs themselves which has been really amazing because i have felt quite powerless during lockdown to not be able to see things for myself and the only thing that didn't make me feel uh totally lost was the fact that that there were so many people out there that there are so many people out there that this is yeah the biggest collaboration that that i've ever been involved in because there's thousands of people thousands and thousands of people across australia that are going out of their way to help this investigation you know they're they're dropping frozen frogs off uh, you know on the side of the road as we sort of contactless pick up them, you know, they're, they're posting the dried frog samples. Uh, people are going out and, and doing special trips to, to try and find any more sick or, or dead frogs. They're driving them, you know, an hour to the nearest veterinary clinic that's, that's helping coordinate this effort. They're storing frogs in their freezers, things that probably, you know, most people never thought that they would do. But there's just been i mean it's people care about frogs and i'm so happy i'm not the only one that that does and i just thank everyone so much that's absolutely that's right and people do care about frogs and that's why that's why there are so many of you on this call we know you care and uh and we need to we need to look after um the wildlife of australia and we need to look after animals like these frogs in particular like we said at the start um, there isn't any more important sentinel species the way that amphibians live uh, in their biology you know with their skin in the waterways in our environments they are um, telling us about environmental health and this is um, terribly scary a decade ago i was on the ground in the united states when we started to see bats many different insect eating bats dying uh, in a very similar way from a fungus that turned out to be eventually called white nose syndrome it was a disease very much like this that spread very fast and ultimately ended up wiping out across much of the United States, 95% of the populations of many different species of insect eating bats. A decade on, environments have changed, um, web, food webs have changed, there's many more insects than they used to be, there's, uh, there's more disease being spread by mosquitoes, farmers are using more money on pesticides because there's not as many bats eating insects. The ramifications are extraordinary. Now, 10 years on, we didn't, with the bats, we didn't have an ID app. We didn't have a way for citizen science to uh, be everywhere at once and tell us about what was happening. Um, and it took us a little while to figure out what the disease was and to diagnose it. But to diagnose it, we have even better molecular 
schools now. So I feel like we are in with a fighting chance here. As Jody has said, she is she is on this case. Lots of people are helping. We're going to get to the bottom of this mystery, but the the more help we get, the faster we're going to do it, and that's going to make all the difference. Uh, frogs can't afford uh, this extra sort of insult and injury to their biology in Australia. They're already uh, doing it tough enough. A lot of the questions here. Let's let's talk to these, Jody. Are about you know frogs are also we know threatened by other kinds of things like environmental pollution, right? Like uh, pesticides we might be spraying in our backyards, chemicals that might be uh, flowing into the environment. We don't even know what their impacts are. Do you want to speak to that for, for a moment? Yeah, uh, so I mean, frogs are sort of suck up chemicals from, from all around. Uh, and so they are incredibly affected. Uh, we have a limited understanding of how toxins affect frogs in Australia. There's been a bit of work overseas. Uh, certainly some, some pesticides, uh, herbicides are capable of even, uh, I guess, ch changing the hormones in the frogs, or even sex reversal, some crazy things. Um, we just have very little understanding of how everything works together to impact our frogs. But you know, Chris, you're right. We, we also don't know the flow on consequences of, of this event. So given the frog's importance in ecosystems, there's a very real possibility that this is going to have more far reaching implications, certainly from the places in other parts of the world where frogs have declined. We do know that there are irreversible changes to ecosystems. So nothing kind of fills the hole that's left by frogs after they're gone. And just as importantly, I mean, can we imagine an Australian summer without a green tree frog or a parents tree frog? frog or something that's that's in our backyard um and you know i i do think that that you know it, there is potential i mean some frog species will will be fine um but there is potential to have real consequences particularly when frogs i guess they don't just get a, a sort of a, everything's fine again after this even if this whatever is causing this completely disappeared because they're already on the edge um and it, it's very very hard work um i guess working on the species that we know are on the edge of extinction so much effort goes into to trying to save those we don't need any more on that list we just can't handle it and we don't want to lose any more of australia's frog species they're part of our they're part of us you know they're part of the country absolutely jody they are they are part of the country and no we can't we can't imagine that summer where you know uh frogs have gone silent and why because of, of you know the things that that we and and you know humanity around the world has done that's warming the planet that's adding toxins into our environment that um, knowingly or not is is spreading diseases that have huge impacts on our 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 environment wow. and and our natural world we can't imagine that and we 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 can and I don't think we will let that happen so that's why we're here today uh, it is an extraordinary call to action I thank you very much Jody for you know, getting us right down into the center of this detective work about such an important event. This is highly unusual. We rarely see something like this. The time to attack this is right now. We're on the case. Uh, help us out. Thank you very much, Jody. Um, I'm going to ask Kim McKay to come back in and uh, close out our session today. We appreciate so many of you joining us today. Hey, thank you so much, Chris, and thank you so much, Jody. I, uh, I just love listening to you. I love your knowledge and your breadth of knowledge about frogs, but mostly uh, that passion you have for this extraordinary group of animals across Australia and the world, and uh, sharing that with us, and also sharing this really, what is obviously a very difficult and emotional issue for you, but really important for all of us. It's about who we are as Australians. Our wildlife and our natural environment helps define us. It helps define our character. And when part of that comes under threat in such a, a vivid way as this mortality event is demonstrating, um, you can't help be moved by it. So thank you so much. And to all of you who joined in today to listen, we really, really appreciate it. As Chris said, you know, we're, we're raising money uh, to help us do more work on this, to help Cody and her team along with Karanga Zoo, to find exactly what is happening to these animals. 
Uh, we're, we're seeking government grants, and that's good. That's in the background that we're talking to the state government and the federal government about some additional funding there. So that's very positive. But our aim today is to raise $100,000 to carry out this research work so we the field studies needed over the coming months. Now, we've already raised from a lot of your existing generosity uh, just under $50,000 for this. So today we've, we've got to add to that hopefully another 50,000 from our important donors. And I should say every donation is important to us, whether it's $2, which is tax deductible or $200 today, we really will spend that money wisely. It's for Jody and her team to get back out in the field and to be able to ascertain what is happening to these frogs. I know she has her suspicions. She doesn't want to talk about that just yet, but um, we need to do more research to be able to demonstrate it. And of course that research then is presented to government and we can get more action happening for protection of our biodiversity. Um, the link is on the screen, australian.museum forward slash frog hyphen appeal. And it will take you straight to the um, Australian Museum Save Our Frogs campaign page on our website where you can make that donation. And uh, of course it goes without saying you can also hope this help this project by getting out in the field yourself and recording the frog calls and if you do see the dead frogs following Jody's guidelines and getting them back to us here for further research as well. So Frog ID Week is coming up of course on the 12th to the 21st of February so we urge you to get out and be part of that, record the, the living frogs but also note that there are a whole group of frogs and Jody showed us that map is chilling uh, to look at. So your donation today will go a long way, I promise you. We're very careful with to us. And I just would really urge you to support us. If it's a small amount, that's great. If it's a bit larger, that's great too. So thank you for your support. Thank you for joining us today. This was really, really important to get this update from Jody and hear from Chris too. And know that the team at the Australian Museum are out there working every day and every night, it seems, on your behalf as well. So thank you all for joining us. Please support Frog ID Week coming up by recording those frog calls. And also, if you can stretch to make a small donation, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us today. Good.